Hi, welcome to the Al Franken podcast. We've got a really good one for a change. Uh, it's Howard Feynman, who uh, younger folks listening may know only from MSNBC. He's the guy who looks like an older, grayer Max Weinberg, Bruce Springsteen's drummer. Uh, Howard has had a 45-year career thus far as a journalist. For years, he wrote the political cover stories for Newsweek, and Howard was one of those guys like David Broder, who would travel all over the country, and he'd ride the bus uh, with the other reporters, and then he'd talk with locals as part of his story. So Howard knows this country very well, but a part of the country he knows probably better than any other Beltway journalist is Kentucky, because Howard's first job as a reporter was for the Louisville Career Journal. So Howard knows Kentucky, and he's covered Mitch McConnell for decades, and I thought it was time for a a podcast to help my listeners understand how cynical and power-hungry and just awful the uh, current majority leader is. And so Howard and I sat down this past uh, Thursday and recorded our conversation, but Mitch is so awful that while we were discussing how he is destroying our institutions and our our democracy, he did another wretched thing. What McConnell did was put a hold on the Securing American Federal Elections Act. Now, this is a bill that had been passed by the House that would direct $600 million in election assistance to the states and require backup paper ballots so the results can't be hacked. And you can do a recount that you can rely on. Now, I'm going to quote from the Washington Post, Dana Milbank. Quote, McConnell himself responded this time, reading from a statement, his chin melting into his chest, his trademark thin smile on his lips. It's just a highly partisan bill from the same folks who spent two years hyping up a, a conspiracy theory about President Trump and Russia, he said. Therefore, I object. Now, I, I, I thought the thing about the, the chin melting into the chest was entirely unnecessary, frankly, except that we here at the Al Franken podcast have learned that during the August recess, McConnell is finally getting some work done. And when he comes back, That whole turtle thing will be history, and he will have the tight uh, jawline and neck of a college freshman. It's going to take some time getting used to, frankly. Look, a, a lot of people have been saying the Russians are going to be back. Believe me, they've never left. McConnell put a hold on this election security bill the day after Mueller told the American people that the Russians are going to do everything they can to hack us and interfere with the 2020 election. And also, let's remember that the president said just recently that if a foreign power offers him help in the next election, that he'll accept it. Republicans don't want fair elections. We all know that. They try to make it as hard as possible for certain people to vote. When they gerrymander, they stuff as many Democrats as they can into a congressional district so it's 90% Democratic, so Republicans can have all these safe 60-40 districts around the state. From election to election, they change the location of the polling places in certain neighborhoods. They reduce the number of polling places. That makes for longer lines. They want to make it much harder for certain people to vote. So securing our elections is now a partisan issue. And Mitch McConnell stopped a bill that would prevent foreign countries from hacking our elections. A bill that would require paper ballots so that we'll have a physical record of every vote. 
So Mitch got the nickname Moscow Mitch right after Howard and I finished our conversation. So in the next 50 minutes or so, you're going to learn some some fun stuff about Mitch McConnell from Howard Feynman, who began his distinguished career in Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, this is Harold Finneman of the Courier Journal in Louisville. I'm here broadcasting from 6th and Broadway in downtown Louisville across the state of Kentucky, from Pikeville to Paducah. Now, Howard, <laughs> yes. explain yourself. So, Al, when I uh, first went down to Kentucky, I began to realize that uh, Howard is not a, a, a very common name there, but Harold is an incredibly common name. So when I would call up public officials to interview them, they would inevitably call me Harold. And there was one guy in particular over in the Department of Energy in Kentucky. I'd call him up and I'd say, hey, Mr. Stapleton, it's Howard Feynman from the Courier-Journal. And he'd say, hey, Harold, how you doing? <laughs> and, and I would say, I'm fine, sir, but it's Howard. And he'd say, right, Harold. Now, what was you calling about? Uh, and also my byline in the, in the paper uh, read Howard Feynman. And just as there are not many Howards, there weren't many Feynmans. There were a couple. Really? There, yeah, there weren't many. And most people read that as Finneman. So basically, I went through my nearly five years in Kentucky as Harold Finneman. And as a matter of fact, that's how I'd like to be known on this episode of the Al Franken podcast and say it in case I say something that I need to deny. Hi, everybody. You are in for a treat today. <laughs> Howard Feynman is my guest. And here's the treat. We're not going to be talking about Howard Feynman. <laughs> uh, we're going to spend the next. Well, that's it for me, Al. I'm sorry. I'm out of here. We're going to spend the next minutes talking about Mitch McConnell. All right, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Let's get this out of the way. We're friends. Yes. Yes. I, I think I have to disclose that. And we met in, uh, I think it was December or late November 1987. Late, late 1987 on the way to Iowa. We were flying to Des Moines because of, there was a debate, a Democratic primary debate in Iowa. And this was... My first one-man uplink unit, the thing where yeah. I wore the satellite dish right. on my head. And Which is an idea that I claim I had first, but I didn't have a TV show to put it on, so there you go. Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Spence with that whittily. Uh, so... Anyway, and and I knew that there would be all – there's this place in the parking lot where they have all the trucks. Yes. And so I knew there would be a lot of satellite dishes there. Yes. And I thought that would be a, yes. a fun backdrop. What I liked was uh, that you uh, had a real desire and uh, intuitive sense of uh, how to evaluate what, what was going on in politics. So I feel that I was there, at, you know, present at the creation of what turned out to be a great political career. So, well. Thanks. You're welcome. And you have a decent sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, one of, one of the problems of our relationship is I'm always trying to be funny in front of you, which is yeah, it's difficult and a big mistake. Big mistake. Because it's an amateur playing in a professional league. I mean, you discovered that I had a fairly deep understanding of politics, and I discovered that you had a deep understanding of politics as well. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't surprise me. Okay. Uh, also, I discovered that, um, that Howard has a, a fabulous sense of humor. You are selling yourself short. And by that, I mean you, you laugh easily. <laughs> <laughs> that's what... Uh, My number one rule is to laugh at whatever Al says. Yes, that's the only thing <laughs> comedians care about. So, Mitch McConnell, uh, your first beat yep. was Louisville. Right. And it is Louisville. Yes, it is. It is Louisville, and uh, the way you say it, if you're from Louisville, is to collapse it all into one melted syllable, Louisville. So Louisville, and uh, so you go along. You go back to what year with with Mitch well, McConnell? Well, I, I what, uh, covering Mitch McConnell. Really, uh, I. It's possible that I met Mitch McConnell when I first started out in Louisville in the fall of seventy. Three, and uh, Mitch, who was then uh, a lawyer in private practice, was in in Louisville. Was in the process of taking over the rather defunct Republican Party of Jefferson County, which Louisville was in. If I didn't meet him right away, 
I pretty soon after that began to know who he was because he got involved in local politics, and I covered a little bit of local politics from the beginning, not much. That was a prestige beat that I didn't have the seniority or the knowledge to be on exactly. And, Conten- and when did you guys, like, then? when was he aware of uh Well, we, 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 got, we, we really didn't get to know each other until uh, I was already at Newsweek magazine oh, a number okay. of years later, and he had been elected to the Senate. And uh, naturally enough, I wanted to keep in close touch with members of the Senate from Kentucky mm-hmm. and House members from Kentucky. So you have a, uh, a go- long-standing journalist politician relationship, yes. and you can't help but love the guy, right? <laughs> well, it's an, I have an interesting attitude towards Mitch, which I still haven't entirely, in every molecule of my body, given up which is that he started out as a moderate and even liberal Republican who was pro-civil rights and and pro-abortion. I kind of think I know where this is going, and I would give up that molecule. Well, and also uh, he'd had polio as a child and uh, is something of a loner, and I persist in thinking that— And you'd think that would give you a lot of, you know— Yes. feeling and sympathy and, and you would that care he, about people and, that he's done is he's done everything <laughs> he can in his public role as a politician to drive away anybody's desire to view him sympathetically as a person he actually makes it very difficult for anybody to like him personally even people who deal with him all the time and who are on the same page politically with him now, whatever page he happens to be on at this point. So you're, in his life. you're saying even people in the caucus. Yeah, even people in the caucus. I mean, they they respect him, they fear him, they understand his uh, keen strategic sense and his his big brain for the mechanics of politics. But would they all like to spend a lot of time with him personally or any time with him personally? I don't really think so. And so as a reporter. I try to see the humanity in everybody I cover because mm-hmm. uh, I think that's the way you view your fellow man and the way, best way to cover politics. But Mitch makes it awfully hard. He makes it awfully, uh, awfully uh, hard. I'll give you an example of what makes it hard. This week, these coal miners with black lung, which kills you, you die. Which is from breathing coal dust in the mines. Right. Yeah. Uh, came to Capitol Hill, and Kentucky, of course, is a big coal state. He came into the room where they were and spent, it look, it sounds like less than a minute. Well, that's a good example of his public willingness to play the utterly unsympathetic defender of corporate interests. He's proud of that. I would say that Mitch McConnell is undoubtedly proud of the fact that he did what he did yesterday. He's telling himself, these people are never going to support me. They're trying to show me up by doing this caravan trip to Washington. They're lucky to be getting anything by way of a federal tax to replenish the black there, lung there fund. There is a, a fee yeah, it, that the coal companies pay for whatever per ton. Per ton, per ton. Uh, and they've halved it. It's been halved. Yes, it's, it was $1.10 cents at, uh, a ton. Now it's down to $0.55. Cents. They literally chopped it in half. And, and I'm sure McConnell is utterly unapologetic about that. And what's interesting? And they want it just to be restored. Yeah, they want back it to be to, restored back to where it was. And the, by the way, uh, under great pressure from uh, your buddy and mine, John Stewart, the Senate voted, and McConnell supported replenishing that fund, the nine eleven, the nine eleven yeah. fund yeah. for seventy years, making it whole for seventy years under the actuarial expectations. And he won't do the same thing, anything like something akin to that in his own state where he's always arguing when he runs for re-election that isn't it great that Kentucky has such a important and powerful guy in the Senate mm-hmm. with all this seniority, with all this power, he can do all these great things for Kentucky. Well, there's an example of him just basically spitting in their eye. Well, it depends who you consider Kentucky because if somebody owns those coal mines and they're probably – from Kentucky, maybe some of them, maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> not necessarily. But but those people he's courted, 
Sure he has. He's, Forever, right? Yeah, yeah, when he first ran for the Senate in 1984, uh, after two terms as the chief executive of Jefferson County, he that was a time, and I'd, I'm not left there that long before, and I knew it because I covered it, the coal industry was undoubtedly the most powerful political force in the state. Uh, the electric utilities were in concert with them, and they burned all the coal for the electricity in the state. But the utilities were regulated by the state public service commission, and they were a little more cautious politically. The Coal Operators Association, the KOA, was way out front, way intimidating in their politics, way eager to play the bad guy. They didn't care. That was the way they thought they would control the, you know, obstreperous miners and so forth. And and Mitch McConnell from Louisville, where it was hard to get elected statewide, did whatever he could to play up to them, and he's done it ever since. I mean, he's proudly in the pocket of the coal the industry. Operator, the operator, the, the owners. The owners, the owners. He's proudly in the pocket. And the miners at that time, and still in Kentucky, are mostly union. They're mostly members of the United Mine Workers. And Mitch is the uh, sworn enemy of unions. Even though he began his career when he first ran for county executive with the endorsement, he sought and got the endorsement of the AFL-CIO Council in Louisville and then promptly ignored the fact that he'd done so as soon as he got elected. Not, not only did he, he ignore it, I, I read this book, The Cynic, mm -hmm. about him. Not only did he ignore them, he actually said that, yeah, I, uh, I said I was pro-union, but I didn't mean it, but I just did it to get the AFL-CIO's endorsement. Yes, and that, that is another signature part of the public persona of Mitch McConnell. He proudly advertises his political cynicism. He's proud of it because he's told himself it's for a higher purpose of rolling back the role of government <laughs> in our lives. That, I mean, I think that's how he justifies it. His favorite philosopher, I don't know how much philosophy he actually reads, is, uh, is Edmund Burke. And uh, he considers himself when he's trying to claim an intellectual gloss for what he's doing yeah. as this principled conservative. But really what he's always been for is power and strictly for in a way that I haven't seen in any other politician that I've covered in the Well, he the admit Senate. like, oh, he's proud no, of the, it. The, the Edmund Burke thing is, is um, that, that's, that's not true. I just say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is just a... God. Get dummies like Howard Feynman to go read Edmund Burke, but the the yeah he's he's naked he's naked about it. And in that sense, he he was Trump before Trump was Trump, because one of the keys to both of them is their utter shameless pride in their cynicism and their power manipulation. And what's what gives it a twist with Mitch McConnell is that he claims to adore and revere institutions like the Republican that's, Party. That's the Burkean yeah, part the, the, of yeah, but the, that's not true. No. He <laughs> not that's, only is it not true, oh. not only is it not true, Al, he has done everything he can to destroy the independent power of those institutions and gather that power in his own hands. He's basically, if not being the major cause of ruining the Senate as we used to know it, he's, he's done it and he's gathered the power in his own hands. As for the Republican Party, he became a willing ally of, of uh, Donald Trump in destroying the independent power of the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell became the first and best of the modern fundraisers who made the money go through him. But unlike Lyndon Johnson, who did the same thing, Mitch didn't do it for the purpose of building up the Democratic Party at all. He did it only for himself. We really should give some time to defending Mitch. So we should give some time to that. Okay, that's, that's enough. <laughs> so now, okay, so he, he... Well, I maintain that molecule of hope, let's say that. I, I, I don't I know why. No, well, I don't know why. I, don't, I, I just don't know why. Okay, uh, school busing, because that's been in the news yes. of late. Yeah. And I remember Louisville had a big school busing thing in 1974, and it wasn't popular. Is that right? No, it was it was a federally court-ordered busing for integration mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. It was the same year as Boston. 
and that was also a federally court ordered one. And in Louisville, it, what it did was it, it ordered the combination of the city of Louisville schools, which had been desegregated on their own the decade before, and which had almost all of the blacks living in that county of Jefferson County, and the county suburban schools, which were almost entirely lily white. And when that federal court order came in, uh, it exploded the city. The powers that be at the newspaper I worked for uh, in government tried to be responsible, tried to uh, make it work, tried to make the combination work. It became one of the largest school districts in the country. But there was severe and sometimes violent protests against it in those suburbs. It essentially ruined the career of the chief executive of the county at that time. It didn't help the mayor that much either. But the reason you bring up that county guy is that he ran against Mitch, right? Yes. He was the incumbent in 1977, Mitch McConnell, realizing that the busing issue had severely damaged the incumbent, saw that he had an opening, and it was created by busing. But since he'd had a moderate background and since he wanted the support of the powers that be in the region... He was very shrewd about not using, directly using the busing issue in his campaign or in his advertising. Yes, he didn't have to. Even though he privately knew that he didn't have to because it had so weakened his opponent. Uh, But as soon as he won, he made it clear that he was for an amendment to prevent federally court-ordered busing. We obviously had this come up in the Democratic debates. Kamala Harris brought that up to criticized Biden for being for local. So she must be for federally mandated busing, I would think, then, right? Well, now. I she, mean, now. Because, she, I mean, let me uh, the problem still exists. I mean, yes, we are as. It's even worse in some respects. Yeah. So because we're still a lot segregated. of the white. Yes, because what happened in places like Louisville and elsewhere, uh, especially in the South, the white people fled the fled the public schools. And uh, this is true all over the country, actually. And in the South, they're called Christian academies. But all around the country, yes, white people have fled the public schools, so the situation in many respects is even worse. The problem is you can't have a court order. On the Christian schools. Yeah. But yes, in the debate of the other week, Kamala Harris seemed to be saying that she supported federally court-ordered busing as she criticized Joe Biden for not doing so and for saying that it could be a local initiative, but it can't be ordered from above by the federal courts. But that's her position now. Is that what you're saying? No, that's not her position now. Her position now is, I really am not in favor of federal court-ordered busing either, and it should be a local concern. I see, but that's what I meant. I mean, so her position now... Is closer to where Biden was if not identical with where with where Biden is. She should have said that. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's see if that comes up in the next debate, because Joe Biden has said, you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm going to fire back. I was not prepared for that last time. I will be this time. I would expect, I think, uh, the way the debate is set up for Detroit, the two nights of debates, I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are on the same night. So I would expect that subject to come up again. Okay. So he he runs for the Senate. Roger Ailes is his guy. Yeah. He does, does his ads. So And Roger Ailes is on his way up in the yeah. Republican Party. Well, yes. So this is just nice guy, nice guy. <laughs> One, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Roger Ailes had, uh, had not yet distinguished himself with the Willie Horton uh, stuff. Uh, in the race issue later on, which happened a few years yeah, later. he's ramping up to that. He's ramping up to that. But in the case of uh, Mitch McConnell's race in 84 in Kentucky, Ronald Reagan was a very popular president with Republicans and pretty popular overall. And uh, Mitch was lucky to be running for Senate for the first time out of Louisville, which, as I said, hard to get elected statewide from Louisville. Uh, with Ronald Reagan at the top of the ticket. Ronald Reagan won Kentucky by about 235,000 votes. Mitch McConnell barely beat, barely beat uh, a colorless incumbent named D. Huddleston from Western Kentucky, the Democrat. And their ad that Roger Ailes produced was the famous ad in which 
Uh, they harped on Huddleston's uh, mediocre attendance and voting record. He didn't show up all the time to vote. And they had a bunch of bloodhounds pouring out of the back of a pickup truck searching for D. Huddleston. Bloodhounds looking Blood for Bloodhounds looking for well, that's D. Clever. Huddleston. <laughs> Well, it sounds like a real clever Well, ad. that had the additional benefit for Mitch <laughs> of making it seem like he knew what a bloodhound was, which I'm not sure that he did since he grew up in the suburbs of Louisville. Okay, so he's in the Senate, and uh, McCain-Feingold comes up, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, because when we did the Disclose Act later, after Citizens United, we wanted at least for disclosure, yes. which Kennedy, who wrote the opinion on Citizens United had said, this will be great because everyone will know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was in the, the decision. Yes, I know. I know. So we wanted to, uh, the Democrats wanted to uh, have a, disclo- a thing where you disclose. And he had said during McCain-Feingold, he said that uh, disclosure is the great disinfectant. That's what he said, right? Yeah. And a lot of them, like Orrin Hatch and those people who voted against McCain-Feingold, said similar things. Disclosure, 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 I remember one of them saying. Of course, we had 59 in the Senate at that time, Democrats, because uh, Scott Brown had won the race. So we have, we have to get every Democratic vote and one Republican, and we don't get it. Mm-hmm. When we know we're not going to get it. So I'm sitting in the well. I memorize who said what. <laughs> so you know senator mcconnell and he's walking up to do his vote and i go like sunshine's the greatest disinfectant and uh he just ignored me of course every once in a while someone would get irked that i was throwing that in their faces and they'd say something like well uh this one treats unions differently than corporations and i go no it doesn't <laughs> And then they they go ah uh, uh, nay, and then <laughs> and then so at one point a senator comes up and says maybe the stupidest thing, Republican senator says maybe the stupidest thing I heard from any senator uh, while I was there, and I say uh, I'm saying something to somebody about what he had said, and he goes like, well you know some people don't have to disclose, and I go. What, what do you mean? Like who? Who doesn't have to disclose if they give over $10,000? Well, uh, let's say the New York Times runs an editorial. It doesn't have to disclose. And I said, it's in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, nay. Well, that was actually uh, very stupid but very revealing. <laughs> In the in the sense that uh, he viewed, uh, as they all did, places like the New York Times as purely political entities. Yeah, they're saying that it's that's like a pack. Worth something, yeah, 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 but it's yeah. kind of disclosed. Well, look, one of the consistent patterns of uh, Mitch McConnell's career is that every time you think he can't be that cynical and disregarding of what he said or argued before uh you're proved wrong because he <laughs> because he has he has something that oh. that is a gift for certain politicians which that he was born without uh the the DNA that creates the emotion of shame in the public mind i mm-hmm. mean in in his mind he's he cannot be shamed into admitting that any of his hypocrisies or cynicisms he's proud of him he's he's not only not ashamed of him he's proud of him because he thinks he's doing it for a higher purpose and what he's told himself is the importance of not letting the government run everything uh and this is a powerful thing in kentucky i mean i i spent five years there and of course the great paradox is that kentucky is one of the places where more citizens rely on federal benefits than, than most places in the country. Uh, one pl- well, they uh, must realize that. No, they don't. They, Kentuckians. No, they don't. They don't realize it. They're not grateful because it goes against their view of themselves. Right. Okay, so uh, I, uh, here's a really cynical thing he did. In 2006, and George W. Bush wrote about this in his uh, memoir, 
no bigger supporter of the war in Iraq than Mitch McConnell. But he goes to the White House and he asks President Bush to to draw down the troops mm-hmm. <laughs> before the uh, 2006 election. So it looked like he's kind of moving to get out. Mm-hmm. And Bush says something like, I'm, I'm going to have as many troops as I can to win the war, not to win the election. Yeah. People get killed because you draw down at, for no reason. Well, well, again, Mitch McConnell's only concern... For some reason, from a young age, uh, he decided that what he wanted, the, his route to power and control of his circumstances, which I guess you could argue he felt as a, as a polio victim or whatever he didn't have, right. is to be the majority leader of the Senate and, and run the Senate in the, in the manner. I, I don't, he's never given any particular credit or nod to Lyndon Johnson, but, you know, Robert Cairo, uh, the great journalist and biographer, yeah. has spent basically his whole life trying to figure out and 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 describe Lyndon Johnson's greatness as a political figure, uh, which was based on being Senate Majority Leader. And and I guess Mitch grew up during that time, and for some reason or other, maybe it was that decided he wanted to be Majority Leader, and uh, and be like Lyndon Johnson or the Lyndon Johnson of the Republican Party or something. I don't know what. So he's sort of actually the anti Lyndon Johnson in yes, the sense that Lyndon LBJ Johnson built taught. up the Great Society and uh, signed the civil, pushed the Civil Rights Act, and and, and did as best he could domestically right. to make the government a force for good. Uh, Mitch is exactly the opposite. He want, and he, but he wants that power, so he would be utterly willing to go in and tell George Bush that. Not because he cared about the war, Mitch McConnell, who, by the way, got didn't have to go into Vietnam because of the... He would, had a genuine 4F. He had a genuine 4F, but it wasn't... Good for him. But interestingly, it wasn't coming through quite fast enough for him to get out of uh, uh, the training that he was in uh, so he could pursue his 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 uh, legal career and then his political career. So he got John Sherman Cooper to uh, senator Senator John Sherman Cooper, who he worked for, who he worked for, and who was one of his idols, to to get him out. But in any case, Mitch McConnell didn't care about that, about what was actually happening in Iraq. Jesus he Christ! Doing, uh, you can't can't get a pass on polio, but bone spurs or whatever the crap. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, now I have some sympathy. Yeah. All right. But the a po- molecule. All right. The point. The point is that um, I think it's interesting that George W. Bush saw that for what it was, which was just a an utterly craven political <laughs> ploy. Yeah. And even George Bush is, was too much for George W. Bush, who was not above some of that himself. Uh, put it in his uh, put it in his autobiography. I thought that's very interesting and damning of Mitch McConnell. So Mitch McConnell, um, I got on the bad side of him once, and uh, you don't say. Yeah, Elena Kagan uh, was our nominee. We were about to have the vote on her, and he was, I believe, the second to last speech, and Harry Reid was the last one. So he gave this speech that was unbelievably condescending to her. No one has any doubt that Ms. Kagan is bright and personable and easy to get along with, but the Supreme Court is not a dinner club. If getting along in polite society were enough to put somebody on the Supreme Court, then we wouldn't need confirmation hearings at all. The goal here is not to determine whether we think someone will get along well with the other eight justices. Okay, okay. (laughs) Um, It's a pretty weak argument. Well, I mean, imagine that you're saying, uh, you know, no one has any doubt that Neil Gorsuch is bright and personable and easy on the eye. Uh-huh. I mean, this is so crazily sexist. Oh. Mm-hmm. I start laughing. Mm-hmm. And I can't help myself because the whole speech is like this. <laughs> And I'm I'm presiding. I'm presiding. I should make that clear. Uh-huh. I start laughing, and he's speaking to, the, to me. the Mr. President. That's yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. 
And I'm just going like, I can't stop laughing. Now, this is what most people do when they're presiding. They uh, read their press clipping. <laughs> and, and I, because I was a performer, uh -huh. had been a performer, I listened to every speech. Yep. And I, like, gave eye contact to the speaker. And it was, to some of them, it was unnerving. Yeah. Because no one had ever done that. And were you looking at, <laughs> and were you looking at Mitch and laughing? Yes. <laughs> and that, uh -oh. was, that was a mistake. And I uh, own it as a mistake. It's a mistake. You shouldn't do that. Well, there's no greater wound to Mitch McConnell than when he's standing up there as a leader of the Senate, his lifelong dream to be taken seriously mm -hmm. and not dismissed, but be admired and feared and respected for somebody to laugh in his face. Yeah, he got mad. Yeah. He got mad and he marched up there after he was done and he said, this is not Saturday Night Live. And he said it loud enough for the press is right behind uh -huh. the uh, there. And uh, he said, you do that next time, I'm going to call you out. And and I knew right away that I'd fucked up. And I knew the press had heard it. So um, right away, right after that, I, had, we had, I was presiding, so I had to stay. And uh, we had the vote. And I announced that Kagan was the Supreme Court Justice. Then I went, like a, I went to his office, you know, shoo, weren't there, and he wasn't there. So I left a note apologizing for uh, for myself and saying, I'm, I'm sorry, you know. And uh, then I went to my office, and they said, holy shit. You know, the press had picked it up. And um, so he uh, accepted my apology. So that was... Personally? I mean, was he, it... No, well, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were about to go on a break, so I will say that uh, we just didn't see each other. But his um, his his press secretary issued something like this: uh, you know, uh, Senator Franken's apology is an appropriate response, or something like that. Yeah. So after he got over his fury, then he had you. Yeah. But he let me off. No, I know. know. I, mean, I yeah. know. But then he really had you. Oh, I see. I see. Damn, I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing him, that's that's the thing that just drives him nuts. He doesn't care if he's hated. He pref he expects to be hated, but he expects somehow that that will produce, however reluctantly, in other people respect. respect. Let's go to uh, uh, President Obama gets elected, and he says. The single most important thing we want to achieve is for President Obama to be a one-term president. That wasn't said on election night. Right. Although he, I, he supposedly he might have said that privately to people because what, what he was doing on uh, what they did immediately upon election of Obama was ga McConnell gathered together the troops and they began trying to figure out how they were going to fight him from the start. Because basically, when I came, we had 60 votes. Right. Because Arlen Specter switched. Right. But they were going to delay. They started using the filibuster. Right. He eventually, but he eventually did said, yeah, I think he said in, in early 2010, yeah, our main objective is to make him one-term president. But the point is, from the very beginning, the idea was never, never. And, and what a quaint notion it, it now seems in our politics for the opposition party to say, you know, let's give the guy a little time. Let's see where we can work together to start. For that's, the that's, of course, what we always do, Democrats. No, the Democrats don't do that either. Oh, no, not anymore. Not anymore. That's right, because when, when Trump, but it was Trump. That's not like a real test. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't, well. Can I, you believe that? When Trump came in, yeah. the Democrats said, oh, my God, you know, let's, Let's, but I think that we would have worked with him if yeah. he had had something to work with. Right, and if he had any interest in playing ball that way. But the fact is, in a way, Mitch McConnell prepared the ground for Donald Trump. Yeah, well, Mitch, McCon Mitch, McConnell Mitch McConnell's rejection 
of the idea of cooperation, which you're talking about now with regard to Obama, the sort of wholesale rejection of the system in a way. I mean, to say that you're not going to work with the president is is to violate the spirit and in many ways the letter of the Constitution. And McConnell was perfectly willing to do that, eager to do it, eager to do it, uh, to destroy the relationship between the presidency and the Congress, to, to undercut to the extent that he could the legitimacy of the president of the United States. You know, one thing he did that I, I haven't heard other people talk about, this is something I would go to the APAC dinner and almost every member of Congress would go to it. And it was this bipartisan thing, right? Uh, Before the 2012 election, McConnell gets up, and for the first time I've ever heard, he gives a rabidly partisan speech, uh, basically saying Republicans are the friends of Israel and Obama and the Democrats Mm -hmm. are, you know, its enemies. And I walked out. And I didn't see anyone else walk out, but I walked out because the biggest strategic advantage, geopolitical advantage Israel had was this bipartisan support, Mm -hmm. that we had been totally bipartisan in support of Israel until that moment. And the reason for that is, uh, so Mitch McConnell is undercutting Israel is what you're saying, which which he is. For uh, some political advantage, for some political advantage. Right. He is going, he's saying... He's politicized the whole thing. And the reason is, by that point, uh, Barack Obama had uh, had disagreements with uh, Netanyahu. Netanyahu and, and, and the Democrats were beginning, you saw the slivers of division in the Democratic Party, and Mitch McConnell saw an avenue to exploit those divisions. So suddenly something he basically didn't care much about, it was just a box he was going to check off like every other, became a strategic weapon. Also Sheldon Adelson. Yeah. And the money. Yes. And the money. But but more than the money, because they get money from lots of places. They frankly don't necessarily need Sheldon Adelson for the money. It's the division of the Democratic Party that they're looking at, that they're trying to exploit. And I think he has really done that sure and he's he's done it and it's to the long range if you care about israel's existence it's a long range threat it's now a a a real threat to israel because it has become political i i put that at his feet and he knows that anyway okay then we get scalia dying right okay and merrick garland and my god well there's a new book out that um that uh, I read in preparation for this uh, called Confirmation Bias. It's by Carl Holtz, who's uh, a New York Times, very good New York Times reporter who's covered the Hill for a long time and has covered McConnell for a long time and covered the confirmation hearings for a long time. And he lays out in detail, as did an earlier piece in the New York Times, just how McConnell, within minutes of the death of Scalia, was already setting in stone the strategy of Republican refusal, wholesale Republican refu- refusal to consider a, a replacement during the last year of Obama's term. And McConnell did that. He realized that it was re- important that he instantly, like they were still, you know, carting poor old Scalia's body out of the lodge in West, West Texas when McConnell was on the phone with people saying, we've got to immediately say, and I am going to immediately say, I'm not going to consult with the Republican caucus. I'm going to immediately say and put it out publicly that as Republican leader, uh, we are not going, as majority leader, we are not going to consider a replacement for Scalia in the last year of the Obama term. We'll wait to the next president. Biden rule. Yeah, and we're going to do it. <laughs> yes, Biden <laughs> We're going we're gonna to do it, uh, and they, he wanted to get out ahead of Ted Cruz, who he was afraid would make an issue out of it, and it would be identified with Cruz, who everybody hated, and not with McConnell, who everybody hated but also feared. And, and so he did that, and it was because of McConnell's move, uh, entirely because of that instant decision within an hour of the death of Scalia to put out that public statement, that the result was that... that uh, 
uh, Garland never got a hearing. And I'm, I, was, I was on judiciary, and the Republicans on judiciary kept saying it's the Biden rule. And that was complete bullshit. Yes. Because what Biden had, uh, Biden had given this speech, but it was at the end of a, of a session, like in June of uh, before an, an election. And he was saying, if one of, one of these guys retire, then uh, we're not going to confirm somebody unless, and he said, unless they're, it's a moderate, <laughs> mm-hmm. and he said, um, or, and unless we're consulted. Yeah, I have to say, well, I'm not sure what would have happened to Garland. I think it was outrageous, but uh, that's that's Mitch McConnell. And and it was what he realized that was so I think what would have happened clever. with Garland is that he would have been confirmed because, mm-hmm. and I think that's why he didn't want hearings, is because Merrick Garland is brilliant, and unbelievably, uh, he he was a consensus builder on on the circuit. Yeah, I, that's very possible. But my my point about McConnell is he was so he's so cunning in the in the in the destruction of institutions to serve his own purposes. In other words, the caucus, in theory, the party caucuses are still supposed to be a big thing uh, to some people. Uh, but Mitch totally ignored the caucus in order to issue that public edict, which ended up working. And then after that, he was instrumental in coming up with the the list of uh, the Federal Society, the Federal the- Society list. He works very closely with Leonard Leo and all those people to put together the list. And and he argues, McConnell argues, that it was because of the list. Uh, which he claims credit for, which actually was Don McGahn's idea, but it doesn't matter, uh, that, that got Trump elected. Yeah, and it was. Because basically so? Trump, yeah, that's how he got the evangelical yes. community. That's they why. They didn't trust him, but he said they said, look, here's this list. Well, and it's the Federal Society and the Heritage Foundation, right? Right. right. Uh, anyway. And he's picked people from that, that list and and basically turned over the entire nomination process to to uh, Leo in the Federalist Society. Yeah, a brilliant move. He's, uh, he didn't want, because he didn't think he could win, and maybe even because he found him not only repulsive, but uh, was worried that he couldn't control him. Uh, he was against Trump during the Republican, initially during the Republican primaries. He was almost part of the never Trump thing. He didn't quite get there, which is typical McConnell, but he would have preferred almost any other candidate to Donald Trump. But then when he saw that Trump was actually going to win the nomination, he completely shifted. Uh, I remember him talking about how we can drop him like a a hot rock, meaning Trump. Uh, Mitch embraced the hot rock, and he also learned not to be offended by Trump's style and in fact, to talk to Trump all the time, he talks to Trump constantly because Trump loves phone. And um, he instructs Trump in some of the mysteries of the Senate and makes Trump feel like he knows what's going on. Uh, it's hard to overstate how much power Mitch McConnell now has. I mean, he's right up there with the president. Certainly in terms of the judiciary, he basically, McConnell basically runs it. He basically runs it. Well, McGahn, of course. Did. I mean, the White House counsel. You uh, know what? I want to go back to the ACA Mm -hmm. just quickly and then go to uh, repeal and replace. Okay. Okay. I remember that member Max Baucus from Montana was trying to put together a bipartisan health care plan. And uh, he had Grassley, NZ, and Olympia Snow that he was working with. And this went on for months. And we would have a caucus lunch. Max would make a report and, oh, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And finally, after three months of this or four months of this, he goes, uh, well, it's falling apart. And we, uh, it's not going to happen. We're just not going to get a bipartisan agreement. Arlen Specter says, I could have told you that. 
and I say, then why didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Like, Arlen. And so... Uh, well, for every conceivable reason under the sun, Mitch McConnell wanted wanted to kill that thing and prevent it and, and it's a, stop it's it a, a in, concern, in every it's, conceivable way. It's a plan, For every conceivable reason. Yeah, it's a plan actually put together by the Heritage Foundation. Right. Well, first, all senators, especially ones who've served for a long time, many of them... Not all, but many have to account for previous things they said. And part of Joe Biden's problem running for president is there are lots of Biden rules out there that people can twist and turn around based on what he said over such a long career. And Biden cares about that. He cares about trying to be consistent, even if he isn't. Uh, <laughs> McConnell doesn't care. You can say to him, hey, you know, you're, you protested what Harry Reid did with the nuclear option on the, on the judges, and now you're doing it on even worse than he did. McConnell's not going to buy it. He will, he will not. He's impervious to this. The, well, he's going to say we're, we're doing it because Harry did it. Right. But, yes, he, yes, where he can, he will blame the other side. Mm -hmm. Where he can't blame the other side, he'll just say nothing. He'll just say we have the right to do it. Okay, so now let's go to repeal and replace. Let's we'll say uh, Russia had, yeah, uh, they win in um, in sixteen. They have uh, everything. They have the House, the Senate, uh, and they have the presidency. And suddenly, eight years of saying we're going to repeal and replace, everybody's going like, okay, eight years you've had. Uh, let's see it. What do you got? <laughs> it turned out they did, hadn't done anything. No. To quote Arlen Specter, I could have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Mitch puts 12 men, mm -hmm. 12 white men in a room. Yeah. That's, that's, and they, to come up with something. And what they come up with is like 22 million people will lose their insurance. Medicaid will be slashed. So people in rural, you know, mm -hmm. people will... No longer rural hospitals. I I did a tour in Minnesota of rural hospitals during that time after after he released that plan. Rural hospitals were doing great because they had expanded Medicaid, and that meant there was less uncompensated care. So people now who went into emergency room, Medicaid paid for it. So the hospitals had a lot of money. Yeah. They had more money, so they could hire more technicians right, exactly. and more doctors, mm -hmm. and they could nurses and 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 housekeepers, and the food was better. I went to a rural town in Minnesota, where the best restaurant in town was the hospital cafeteria. Mm -hmm. People would go out to dinner at the you know they got a great lasagna there you know and and people th th they had expanded care people were freaked out at what they did and yet he almost got it done it's interesting i i think that was a miscalculation by him and it cost didn't cost him the senate but it cost him that the argu house. arguably it cost them the house and that was a rare miscalculation from the narrow perspective of accumulating power uh but don't forget mcconnell Back in Kentucky, meanwhile, the trends that he set in motion were beginning or threatening to engulf him because the Tea Party is the natural conclusion, uh, a natural product of, Mc of McConnell's kind of politics as they evolved. They saw him as the establishment guy. Suddenly the way he'd gone and accumulated power in Washington was, a, was something of a threat to him. And a guy came up to run against him in the primary, Matt Bevan, who is now the governor, uh, who seriously challenged him from the, I wouldn't say necessarily from the right, but from, from the populist, anti-establishment perspective. So Mitch probably engaged in that risky exercise partly to defend himself. And uh, it kind of, kind of backfired. I think he's now tamed those people. He's now so close to Trump He's inseparable from Trump, that that will protect Mitch uh, in Kentucky, where he's up again this time, but uh, you have to pitch a totally perfect game to even have a shot at beating him. And he's going to be... It's a Republican state. It's a re totally Republican state now, and he'll, he'll hope to continue putting judges in the courts, and I don't know what else, 
uh, his ultimate hope is for somebody to acknowledge him as a master. Somebody credible. Yes, yeah, somebody credible. Uh, let's, pay a, let's play a joke on him. Let's get Caro <laughs> to call him up and to say, call him up and said, "You know what? I'm canceling the last book, <laughs> the last volume on on Johnson because one, I'm sick of doing Johnson. Yeah, I it's just had enough. <laughs> and two, you're the anti master. You're, you're the I, the destroyer of the Senate. I've been watching you, and God and what, damn, I respect how what's, awful you are. What's more interesting, building or destroying any child knows that destroying, destroying. Yeah. <laughs> any there I you go well, I, I, actually i know a bunch of these popular historians maybe i'll convince my friend meacham to do it john meacham to do it oh just as a joke Joke's a joke <laughs> first i have to make we sure that finally came up with a good idea here on the show yeah i, or on the I have to make sure that that john meacham knows it's a joke yeah yeah, I think he. Will. <laughs> I think he will. I yeah. think he will. Yeah, uh, Howard, uh, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Well, thank you. I uh, hope you had fun. I had a great time. Good, good. Uh, Howard Feynman, <laughs> Howard Feynman, <laughs> uh, pundit extraordinaire. See you next time. Here, how <laughs> Frank <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>